It's time for the 1430 Connection on 1430 WNAV and 99.9 FM. Spotlighting news, newsmakers, and important community issues. Now, with this week's edition of the 1430 Connection, here is WNAV news anchor Donna Cole. Welcome to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. In the studio with me today is David Hildebrand. He's the adjunct instructor of musicology at the Peabody Conservatory and the director for the Colonial Music Institute. Along with him, Elizabeth Sheff is the founding archivist for the Peabody Institute. And welcome to both of you. Well, thank you. Thanks. And I invited you both to be here today because I caught wind of your book that is sitting in front of me called Musical Maryland. It's a history of song and performance from the colonial period to the age of radio. That covers a lot of time for music in Maryland, doesn't it? It does. So how did you come up with a thought process on the book and how did you decide to partner on it? Well, we can't claim uh, that idea. It was our original editor, uh, who approached us separately and knew that I had just finished a dissertation in music in Annapolis up through the colonial period and asked if I'd be willing to co-author with Elizabeth, whom I don't think we knew each other before we were brought together, by Bob Brueger. Dr. Bob Brueger was the uh, original editor of the book. Elizabeth, how long have you been in the field of music? Oh, I suppose since I was about four. And <laughs> w- I'm not asking your age because we don't <laughs> like to do that, but around how many years has that been? Oh, it really is just forever. I mean, I was a student at Peabody in the mid-60s, mid to late 60s. All right, David? I guess I started music when I was six, piano lessons. And um, I've been, it's over a half a century I've been involved Wow. in music. Wow. Tell me about the book, David. It's, you, you say that's a lot to cram in. In a lot of ways, it's musical highlights. We can't cover everything in in tremendous detail. Uh, In some areas, you have to look out and go, okay, well, music uh, happens in churches. Music happens out in the tobacco plantation fields. It happens in taverns. There are wealthy uh, people doing music. There are poor people doing music. There are all kinds of instruments. And when you're surveying it over such a long period of time, I mean, technically, Maryland was founded in the 1630s. And we take it up to about 1950 or 1960. In the 50s, Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of time, and and for each of those categories of music, things are changing within the category decade by decade, so there's a lot of material, um, and we try to hit the, the highlights, some of the most interesting stuff and the significant stuff to Maryland. And let's talk about some of the significant, interesting stuff early on in your book, which would be taking us back to the colonial period, since we are here in Annapolis. Um, Do we have a a combination of different ethnicities playing a big role in this, I would guess, with slaves? Absolutely. Yeah, we have evidence of music making amongst uh, African Americans, both enslaved and free, going back to the dawn of slavery, unfortunately. Um, You can look in the Maryland Gazette newspaper and find runaway ads for Mm -hmm. slaves that describe their musical capabilities as able to play upon the fiddle or the banjo or having stolen their master's French horn, things like that. Right. It's very rich. Um, Elizabeth, what was the biggest surprise to you when researching the book? I really had a leg up because, you know, my part starts with around the Civil War Mm -hmm. and uh, the collection at Peabody starts about the same time. And so it was like dealing with family for me. With knowing the stories and Mm -hmm. tell me, can you relay to our listeners a story that specifically sticks out in your mind from the book that you... Well, I think uh, one of the things that uh, impressed me was the idea that music in the uh, African-American community of the belief that it was just about jazz. And uh, there was a parallel situation going on. I mean, there was a symphony orchestra, a chorus that did classical music, and uh, um, every... Well, Anne Brown grew up in Baltimore. Uh, She was the first... Bess in Porgy and Bess. And actually, I this was a surprise. I didn't know Anne Brown grew up in Baltimore, yeah, 10 yeah. minutes from where I live. And uh, uh, she was very well known locally and uh, couldn't go to Peabody and went to Juilliard. And uh, she knew that there was an opera afoot and uh, went down to audition for Gershwin. And he took her on, and it was uh, after he heard her singing, uh, signed her on right away. Oh, that's amazing. And it was just supposed to be Porgy. And, uh, you know, and like then those there Haywood's came Bess. And she wanted to mm-hmm. sing Summertime. And he took her to lunch, and he said, well, you know, I changed the title 
because you know Bess was so important, and you have such a great voice. Sure, you can do summertime, but we're renaming it Porgy and Bess, so you'll have starring Billy. That's too. wonderful, wonderful story. All right, we're going to take a short break. More about music in Maryland, the history of it, and some great stories that have come from this book. This is Donna Cole on the 1430 Connection. We will be right back. Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. In the studio with me is David Hildebrand. He's an adjunct instructor of musicology at the Peabody Conservatory and the director of the Colonial Music Institute. And Elizabeth Schaff is the founding archivist of the Peabody Institute. And it's so wonderful having you both here today. We're talking about your newly published book, uh, published by the Johns Hopkins University Press. Peabody is part of Johns Hopkins. It's called Musical Maryland, A History of Song and Performance from the Colonial colonial period to the age of radio. David, I was just asking Elizabeth, what was the surprise? What was that surprise story that happened, you know, when she, during the research for the book? What was that surprise to you? I think the whole story of the Star Spangled Banner. It, it's something that I had known back when we started, which was some time ago, that, uh, that it was important. And then it was, you know, our national anthem based upon an English drinking song. And, and I knew a little bit about it. But much later, going uh, forward into time to about 2013, 2012, 2011 actually, we were tipped off that the state of Maryland would be celebrating the bicentennial right. of the Star Spangled Banner in a big fashion, which we certainly did. And that became the impetus for me to dig really much further into Francis Scott Key, his life as a student at St. John's College in Annapolis, uh, his birth in Frederick, Maryland, his composing of a song almost a decade before the Star Spangled Banner. This was the War of 1812. Right. The song had its roots prior to that? Correct. Okay. And Published as a drinking song just about the year Key was born in uh -huh. 1779. But what I didn't realize is, is how deep that story goes and how many myths there are. People say that, you know, he wrote a poem on the back of an envelope when he was a prisoner on a British ship. Not true? He, none of those things is true. So what's the true story? The true story is that he wrote lyrics to a song mm -hmm. that he already knew and had already written one version before, that he was aboard an American ship. He was under guard, but he wasn't officially made prisoner. And um, he, here's the real zinger. He wasn't even seeing Old Glory by the Rocket's Red Glare. He was seeing a small storm flag if he could see anything at all by telescope because he was three to five miles away from Fort McHenry at night. The big flag that survives at the Smithsonian wasn't raised till the morning after. So how did we get this into our into our popular culture, the, the completely wrong story, and we're into our culture, period? There are a lot of myths that float around, and um, they just perpetrate themselves. And what do you think of it? Was, did you see the original lyrics to the song, oh, and yeah. how much did it change? Well, the Maryland Historical Society owns the oldest manuscript copy mm -hmm. in Francis Scott Key's old hand. It includes just a couple of corrections. And it's very likely that that's what Key scribbled out in the hotel when he came back to Baltimore after the British had given up on the attack. Um, yeah, I mean, it just the, the depth of, of understanding, connection, the story of, of how long it took to become our national anthem. In a lot of ways, I, I think this is one of Maryland's most significant contributions to the history of music in the United States, that, that Key was from Maryland, mm -hmm. the event occurred uh, outside of Baltimore, published first in Maryland, and it was the Maryland congressman, uh, Linthicum, who actually proposed the legislation that eventually made it our official national anthem. Hmm. All right. Other surprises to you? Or other significant Marylanders that have contributed to music on the ground scale? Yeah, the other... Uh, um, many of you out there listening probably know John Barry Talley, who for ages was the director of music at the Naval Academy. He did incredible work there. Uh, his doctoral work was on a small group of, of immigrant uh, gentlemen in Annapolis in the 1740s and 50s called the Tuesday Club. And uh, Key had pub excuse me, Talley had published um, his dissertation in book form, and lots of people know about that. But in the world at large, it's a surprise that we think this was the first and oldest chamber music composed in America, mm. at least north of Mexico City. Right. The Spanish had stuff going on in Mexico City. But in colonial British America, the very first composed chamber music 
was here in Annapolis around 1750. I had no idea. Yeah. So this, uh, these are just a few of the stories in the book. You have many stories in the book. We're going to take another short break. When we come back, more about Musical Maryland. This is Donna Cole on the 1430 Connection. We will be right back. Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. In the studio with me is David Hildebrand. He's an adjunct instructor of musicology at the Peabody Conservatory, also director of the Colonial Music Institute, and Elizabeth Sheff. She's founding archivist of the Peabody Institute. So yes, we're talking about music, specifically their book, Musical Maryland, published by the Johns Hopkins University Press. It's a history of song and performance from the colonial period to the age of radio. Elizabeth, you were uh, the writer on the period of the age of radio that's kind of important to us here at 1430 WNAV. What did you learn? Tell us some stories about those people, those early pioneers of radio in Maryland. Well, I loved the reaction uh, when all of this started unfolding um, among the musicians um, at uh, Peabody. One of the professors was just really upset because, you know, they now sound blaring from cars and the, you know, the musicians who are out performing thought, well, their jobs were going to be gone because, you know, they'll have radios in the restaurants and we won't have jobs. And so radio uh, wasn't looked at as all that wonderful by those in the music industry, is what you're saying? Oh, Ever well, initially. There, was a, there were two faces. I mean, you know, musicians were getting works performed and gave them a wider audience. But. And, uh, uh, you know, there was concern about outside musicians but in fact some of the radio stations had live ensembles and uh, uh, composers were having their works premiered over radio and so it worked out not so bad and the early earliest stations uh, were broadcast out of the bedroom of a gentleman whose father owned a store that sold radios Hmm. and uh, so to get people interested in buying his radios, needed to have a radio station. And where was this? I think he lived in in the Pikesville area. Okay. Yeah, but it worked out really well. People did start buying radios and shocking number of, I love, you know, the little radio that, the little giant radio, which was about two feet wide and, but they did, and the musicians, the Baltimore Symphony musicians uh, got involved as well. And, uh, and continued um, while they were playing. Uh, I know uh, Ruth Van Holstein, who was a musician in the symphony, uh, and her husband uh, had regular work in the, tra- in the radio stations, and they would go flying out of, the re- out of rehearsals and dashing up to the radio station so they could perform there. And it was great because, yeah, Baltimore Symphony people weren't um, living high at that point, and the extra income that the stations were providing was pretty good. Yeah. So the one man somewhere near Pikesville started this station and the reach was, did it go into Baltimore? It did. And well, it, it was the city radio station. It was, okay. Yeah. Would other Marylanders have had a significant contribution or organization to the history of music here? Well, it helps to look at the Civil War period mm-hmm. itself. Um, in a, in a lot of ways, the story of our state's song is intertwined with the outbreak of the Civil War. Maryland, My Maryland, in that case, uh, was composed as a poem originally by a Baltimorean, James Ryder Randall, who was living in Louisiana, teaching at a college. And um, he got news of the secessionists in Baltimore firing upon the train bringing the Union troops down from Boston to impose martial law. This is 61. And the whole idea of Maryland as, you know, even though precious few of the actual battles were fought during the Civil War on Maryland territory, Maryland was really right at the, the overlap of the South and the North. And if martial law hadn't been imposed on Maryland, um, the state probably would have would seceded. Have yeah. And so if you look at the musical output, it's very interesting. It, it parallels the advantages and disadvantages one discusses in the Civil War. That, that those in favor of the North, of course, had manufacturing, which overflows into music publishing. 
I mean, some of the beautiful sheet music published during the Civil War comes from the North, even, you know, Chicago and New York and Boston even. Whereas uh, in the South, as the war grinds on, um, there are fewer and fewer places able to publish the new songs coming out. But Maryland, My Maryland, as a state song, became a rallying song for the South, Mm -hmm. which has a lot to do with why uh, I and other scholars were recently summoned by the governor to re- consider the use of Maryland, My Maryland as our state song. Well, this was the third round of discussions going back decades on the appropriateness of the lyrics favoring the South. One verse of which really kind of calls for the assassination of Abraham Lincoln in our state song. It was declined. Governor said, no, the song's fine. What is your thought? You don't think? I I disagree. You think it should be changed? It was actually, we were unanimous as a committee that uh, it should either be played instrumentally with no words. The tune you know, oh, Christmas tree right. is the way we think. Many of us think of the tune. Either play it instrumentally without the words, or if you have to do a verse, just use the third verse because it's the least offensive. Do you have another song that you would prefer to be, if they didn't go to a instrumental? Well, actually, the one on the cover is kind of fun. Um, this is the sheet. The cover of, of our book uh, is the sheet music cover for a song called "Sailing Down the Chesapeake Which Bay." Which Bing Crosby did, and I love the song. I don't know who <laughs> wrote it originally. Go ahead. It goes back to 1911 or so. And I, the author's name, I can't bring to mind immediately. But uh, no, it, that's a tough question to answer. What should be our, our alternative state song? Mm-hmm. I would toss out in question whether we need a state song. You know, we have lots of state symbols. Mm-hmm. But if there's a single song that can't bring everybody together and represent us all, then should we have one? More information about the book is available where? Through the Johns Hopkins University Press. Uh, they have a whole website. You can type in either of our names. Uh, on their uh, website and find the book ordered online. We distribute some copies through our own website, the Colonial Music Institute. Hopefully it'll be stocked at all kinds of Mm -hmm. libraries throughout the state and uh, bookstores. And for those that don't know uh, what the Colonial Music Institute is all about, could you let them know? It is an online uh, source of information, databases, FAQs, it's a place where we list um, the concert schedule that my wife Ginger and I keep mm-hmm. as we perform colonial music out around the country. Um, we distribute other publications that, that we, of which we approve. And um, it's not, unfortunately, we don't have a grand brick mansion somewhere uh, on a street corner named the Colonial Music Institute. It's it's an online presence. But it sounds like it should. We shouldn't <laughs> forget Charlie Bird. Yes, no, we shouldn't it. forget Charlie Bird. <laughs> well, who brought the bossa nova after serving with the State Department in South America. But uh, Charlie was wonderful, and the story about how he decided that he was going to be a professional mu- mu- musician. He was a uh, caught up in World War II and was in the middle of a battle and thought, you know, my friends and family put me here. No one else is going to make a decision for me. I'm going to be a musician. That's what he did. He came yeah. back and became a professional musician that we now all know and love. Another important name might be George Peabody. Oh, right. Yes, uh, yes. One of the wealthiest men on the planet during his lifetime. Yeah. Who loves Scottish songs. He used to go salmon fishing in Scotland. And he bequested his fortunes to your institution. Some of them, yeah. Well, he had friends, he kept in touch with friends in Baltimore and, uh, you know, he was being pressed to do a number of things here. And uh, John Pendleton Kennedy, uh, who was a close friend and uh, uh, who talked him into doing what ended up being, you know, a cultural center for the whole city. And Music, of course, was going to be a part of it. He had boxes at the big opera houses in England Mm -hmm. and in Europe and uh, felt like we should be competing on that level. And it was wonderful. Now we have a wonderful library, a scholar's library, that uh, immediately became a place where you could find all the Hopkins professors and an art collection. It's really wonderful that the conservatory became the dominant part of that wonderful institution. Absolutely it is, and we do have a branch of it here in Annapolis. Thank you very much for joining me today. It's lovely to be here. This is Donna Cole on the 1430 Connection. We will see you next week.